Dubbo is basically the, the central hub of the West. It's the roundabout where everyone usually passes by. Here in Dubbo, they always make eye contact with you, you know, hoping that you'll say good day to them. It's definitely a good little town. When I first came to Dubbo, the moment I was welcomed at the door, I started to fall in love with the church. And I know that Dubbo has had a big history in terms of the people. When I got to meet them, I got to understand them. And as they continue to share the story with me, oh, I just love their vulnerability. I love their honesty. I love their willingness to change, willingness to grow. And it's, it's just really, really helped me grow a, a close bond with this church. This group we called the Back to Back Brotherhood. I was introduced to, to, to these two young islanders here in town. I uh, came straight from NZ. And, you know, we started talking and I said to them, hey, you know, what are you guys thoughts about starting up a Bible study group? And they said, yeah, hey, that'd be great. You know, I asked them, do you guys have a Bible? And they said, no, we don't have a Bible. Well, hey, I'll bring a Bible for you guys next Bible study. And you know the Bible that I brought them? Well, it was a World Changes Bible. After one week, they invited another friend. And then I asked him, hey, do you have a Bible? He says, nah, I've, I've never owned a Bible before. Well, hey, I've got a Bible for you. Went to my car, grabbed the World Changes Bible, laid it in his hands. Now all four of us have the same version. We've had so many guys come through this group and I give them all a Bible. And now we journey as a brotherhood together. Oh, this kid, man. It's a huge transformation. He said to me, you know, Jay, I came to Australia just to party hard and to play rugby. I never thought in my life I would be part of a Bible study group. My name is uh, Robert Murphy, born in New Zealand, Auckland. I have a Tongan background. Grew up in playing footy back in New Zealand, played rugby union first. I uh, was uh, lucky enough to um, get a contract to come over to Sydney and um, played for the Bulldogs on the Toonies and uh, New South Wales Cup team. Had a bit of trouble there, got sent back home. Wasn't allowed in Australia for two years. My manager, like an agent, he like hit me up, asked me if I was keen to come back over. And I'm um, start fresh, start a new journey with footy again, man. Yeah, loving it. So um, I met Jay when I first came to Dubbo. Um, I was at a pub once, and the security guard at the pub, he was a Samoan bloke. And he goes to me, oh man, there's one, there's one guy I want to introduce you to. And I was like, who's that? He's like, a guy named Jay, he's a pastor. He came off Jay to my house. And I met Jay, you know, really energetic, really welcoming, really happy. I told myself, I want to start surrounding myself with the right people. Jay wanted to start up a little group called uh, Back to Back Brotherhood. It's all about like, having a closer relationship with God. It's been over a year now since we've um, been hanging around with these boys. It started off with three of us. Now, there's a lot of lives changed just from this little group. The power of God being, being the center of this group changed a lot of us. Earlier this year, I was part of the group that went to Converge to the camp, my first ever church camp I've been to, and it was just amazing. It, like, I never had that experience before. God is just, he's just transforming lives not just in these boys, but also through them and influencing those around them. And those around them are now asking, hey, what's the difference? What's the change here? You know, this group is like, I'm home away from home. I want to go out there and help someone else's life. Be a leader out in the community. Be a leader out wherever God takes me next.
button's not on. Hello, 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 hello. Yep, sure does. And then the lights turned on, and this one's working. Yay! <laughs> Good morning, and welcome to Orchard Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, you may look at this and go, the title of this song isn't familiar. No, it's not, but the tune is. Once we get into it, you'll know, you'll say, oh yeah, okay, I know this tune, it's just different words. So let's, uh, let's all stand up and we'll sing this song together. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may fail me, foes assail me. He, my Savior, makes me whole. Alleluia, what a Savior, Alleluia, what a friend, saving, helping, keeping, loving, He is with me to the end. Jesus, what a strength in weakness. Let me hide myself in him. Tempted, tried, and sometimes failing. He, my strength, my victory wins. Alleluia, what a Savior, Alleluia, what a friend, saving, helping, keeping, loving, He is with me to the end. Jesus, what a help in sorrow, while the billows o'er me roll. Even when, when my heart is breaking, He, my comfort, helps my soul. Hallelujah, what a Savior, hallelujah, what a friend, saving, helping, keeping, loving, he is with me too. Jesus, what a guide and keeper, while the tempest still is high. Storms about me, night overtakes me, he, my pilot, hears my cry. Hallelujah, what a Savior, Alleluia, what a friend, saving, helping, keeping, loving, He is with me to the end. Jesus, I do now receive him more than all in him I find. He hath granted me 
forgiveness. I am his, and he is mine. Alleluia, what a Savior. Alleluia, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving. He is with me to the end. Father, we have come into your house to gather in your name and worship you. What a privilege it is to be here. Testing. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Oh, here I am. Here I am. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's good to see everyone. And as that gentleman said back there, he's happy to be here. Just to be able to come in and worship together, I think, is so wonderful Amen. to see everybody and. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome Tim Peterson as our speaker today, so don't forget to say hi to him uh, after service. Um, any of you who are new to the church or need prayer um, or just to give a thanks, we have the communication cards behind each of the pews, as most of you know. Please feel free to fill it out. Lots of people are willing to pray for you, pray with you, and pray for your family and loved ones. We all need that a little bit more every day. Um, uh, if you're unable to come to church, of course, uh, we have now have a YouTube channel. So please um, look at that in your bulletin and uh, pass it along to friends and family who uh, cannot come. <laughs> no, you don't need to like and subscribe. Um, and yay, we have potluck today. It's wonderful to be back to normal, getting back to normal. So we do have a potluck today, so please feel free to join us downstairs after the service. Um, for those of you who are volunteering for positions in the church, uh, especially when you work with minors, um, there's a new process for volunteer applications. Um, so please, please read that section in your bulletin. Um, it says, let's see, if you work with children and have not received a volunteer email from Shelly, please let her know. So don't call me, call Shelly. Um, Meadowglade Adventist Elementary School has a fundraiser. They're going to be um, having those little um, booklets. So uh, there's a number on there to call if you're interested. Payback books. Uh, it's also online, so make sure that you take a look at that. Um, we want to yeah, yeah, those are great. I'm keep it in your car. You keep it in your car like I do. <laughs> um, but you know, we we do want to make sure that all of our young people get to stay in our schools. It's so important, especially if you know what's going on in the public elementary schools and schools now. The more children we can keep in our schools, the better off they are. Okay, um, and um, I'll make this announcement for Greg, Adventures and Pathfinders, staffing and registration. It's so wonderful that we're having Pathfinders and Adventures getting together again. Um, we have a lot of young children that we want to keep um, in our church, and this is one of the most wonderful ways to keep them involved 
So um, they do need to have some leadership um, people in here. So um, please, um, let me see. Please call or email the church office if you're interested in doing that. Um, okay. Come on up. Come on up, Jerry. No, not yet. Jerry wants to make a little announcement. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Jerry. Catherine and I, we have a tradition. What did we used to do before COVID, especially down in Portland? Oh, we would make this huge meal for up to 300 people. Nadine was our leadership. Downstairs and take them a wonderful vegan spaghetti dinner and Nadine's pies, which are famous at the mission. Famous. That's all they remember is Nadine's pies. It's just so. the pie ministry, yes. Yes, and she still does them. We just, because of COVID, we haven't been able to make it and serve it over there. But. So what, what remains? What are we doing now since that? Oh, though? We still Nadine's, have the ministry going, We right? still have the ministry going. Nadine still makes the pies with some help, and she's still taking vegetables for the salad makings down there. So it, this ministry has not stopped. It is God's ministry. Amen. And he has kept this going to the best that we can do it. And Nadine has the energy to do it. It is still going on. And what happens next Friday? Next Friday, she makes all the pies. 20, 25, 25 pies, pies. Fresh. Freshly baked. She even puts up the fruit herself. So... It's quite yeah. the endeavor. And can she use some help making? That she always apple can pies? use help. So next, always. next Friday, so say Nadine, Nadine, can you stand and raise your hand so people can see? Okay, <laughs> this is a wonderful ministry, and I really do miss it. We used to be involved where we would serve, and we had, especially the holiday time, we used yeah. to do the music, uh, we would do serving, and we got to know some of the people that, mm -hmm. that came through. They're so section. grateful, so grateful yeah. for it. But at least they're keeping the pie. So one of the things was I hadn't been to Costco in a while. Yesterday I go there, and guess what? They have pumpkin pie. It's October, people. <laughs> I love uh, I love pumpkin pie. Yeah. Got to put a little dabble of that uh, Land of Lakes uh, whipped cream on top yeah. or something too. <laughs> anyway, but you know what? Here's another way. So during this holiday time. During the time they have pumpkin pie, and then they probably have pecan pie, and apple pie. You can tell he likes yeah, pie. <laughs> I know. Yes, you can tell. Yeah. <laughs> See these? So when you're done, just don't. You know, uh, uh, the best way to recycle: save them and bring them here to church. It's kind of like we don't have the. I have saved my labels, labels, labels. Remember that? <laughs> but you can come singing. The new thing, I have saved my pie tins, pie tins, pie tins, right? <laughs> so do, and, and all parts, she can use it all because mm -hmm. it's helpful because these wear out after a while. And she's doing, what, 25, 26 pies a mm -hmm. month. Do it on the second Friday of the month, mm -hmm. yes. So do, keep that. I brought, I brought my pie tin. Um, but it's a good thing to do. And I'm glad you also said about uh, we have a fellowship meal downstairs, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, so... If you like pumpkin pie, come on down and say hi. <laughs> anyway, but God has greatly blessed the ministry. Nadine Amen. also mentioned that some of the, the costs we do have on our uh, tithe and offering envelopes. There is for, do we call it the Portland Rescue Mission? I think. Yeah, it's RSVP. Ministry. RSVP, yes. So, yeah. so under that, for some of the supplies, uh, she's kind of coordinating. The Lord has kept this going. Um, so... And anyway, for those of you who don't know yeah. what RSVP means, it's Royal Street Vittles program. So that is for our homeless feed. So don't yeah. forget that, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Okay, our our church's combined budget. Again, we need to keep our church open for all you wonderful people who come to church. Um, for all the programs, so please um, remember that. And for special offering, come on up, Nadine and Randy. <laughs> we have a night in Bethlehem. Um, you've seen me here a couple of times already. Here are, are a couple of my, come on up here. 
Come and show them. <laughs> it is two months away, only two months away. Um, will it, can I finish? Okay, thanks. <laughs> I, I just need to finish before I forget. Thank you to everyone who has volunteered to participate in Night in Bethlehem. Again, we haven't had it since 2019, and it's so wonderful to get to do this this year. Um, there are still positions available as cast member in the village or assisting downstairs in the fellowship hall. Please let your friends and families know about this program as well, because if they're interested, they can participate. We need... Um, all parts of this to work together and people to fill these spots in order to get this program um, done. And, you know, what better way to tell people about Jesus, especially now we need to share Jesus with people. Um, they need to hear it. They need to be reminded about the birth of our Lord and that they have a Savior um, and this is one of the most wonderful ways that we've been able to share that with our community. So um, please keep this in your prayers. If you have not volunteered for a position yet, um, we have Randy here, um, who you can call, or Sandy. Where are you, Sandy? Stand up, Sandy. That's Sandy. These, these two people... We'll be making phone calls, more phone calls, and um, uh, we'll let you know what positions are available, and if you can think of something you're interested in, feel free to call these two people. Um, let's see. Sorry, I don't have my glasses on. Oh, okay. Well, we'll leave them your phone, their phone numbers. Uh, for anyone needing a copy of the script who has already volunteered, please come and see me. Um, after service, I'll also be down um, at Potluck, and I have the scripts there. In two weeks, we're going to be passing around sign-up sheets for cookie and apple cider donations. Um, we do pass out cookies downstairs in the fellowship hall and hot apple cider. Um, for the people who have finished the tour, um, we get to uh, visit with them. So we could use a couple of people down there, too, visiting with them, asking them how they liked it and um, let them know about our church uh, and about Jesus, actually. Um, we will have postcard event announcements available for you to pass out to your family, friends, and neighbors. They'll also be mailed out in the community, so um, Isla's going to order those in a couple of weeks, so we'll have those available for you to take. Um, and again, just keep this endeavor in your prayers. It is huge. If you've participated in this before, if you've walked through the village before, you know how many people it takes, you know the efforts and the uh, great job that all of our volunteers have done, um, so please keep this in your prayers. Uh, we greatly need them, and I just thank you again. And Randy wants to say something. You know, you pretty much covered everything I wanted to say, except for you alluded to uh, a lot of work and a lot of people. How many people? Because that was always surprising to me. I know it says about 65. There may be a little bit more um, that we need to get all of this done. And that includes cast members. That includes uh, the program inside the church. And again, Mike would, Mike would know. Um, Mike would know how many people he needs for this program inside, but at least 65 people. And that's not counting the people who set up the tents. Um, and a lot of people do double duty, don't they, Pastor John? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a lot of people are needed. So the tents all be uh, coming uh, right around the corner. This is October 1, you guys. So we're starting to really get excited. Things are ramping up. And... Um, you know, I was just, I was thinking about this this morning, and I thought, nothing good has ever come easy for me. If it's good, it's worth a lot of effort, a lot of work, and it takes dedication, it takes time, it takes patience, but it is so rewarding. 
Amen? And that's really where we are. We have a season where we're able to express and give. We have camaraderie that we can cling to and collectively come together and build upon as a, as a church. And I don't know about you guys, but I am so busy with work and my life and youth that I hardly have the opportunity to express or share with, about the Lord, um, except with you guys. And so for me, it's an opportunity to express my love for the Lord and in a, in a way that is fun and interactive. And, I, and the other thing I was thinking about is we're going to get hit big time. People are done with COVID, and they want out, and they're going to be coming to this. It's been a while. So we've got the people who used to come, and I think, I sure hope and pray I'm right, that we're going to have a lot of people that are going to be coming through this village, and what a neat opportunity to come together and, and serve the Lord in, a, in this capacity. So. Five hundred, yeah. So um, anyway, uh, we're meeting today during potluck, after potluck, and we are trying to put things together. So if if you can help and serve in any capacity, please please do that. Thank you. We have plenty of costumes, so you don't need to worry about trying to make something. <laughs> so please, with your special offering donations. We do need some funding for Night in Bethlehem, and it would be greatly appreciated. So thank you very much, and happy Sabbath. So yesterday I was at work, and I, I have the privilege of working with several Christian individuals. And one of them says, I said something about I'm hungry. I, you know, I, could, I could eat right now. And he's like, oh, I've had food about which you know nothing. And I said, oh, you've been talking to that woman at the well again, haven't you? And I heard this snicker down at the other end of the room. And I was like, yep, there's another Christian knows his Bible. That was so much fun. Just moments like that are, are just so uplifting. Have you experienced the power of God? in your life yes tell us just just this past week real yeah. quick here um, I'm noticing that as each day goes by and I'm making a conscious choice to really have that close connection with Jesus mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit and to worship Creator God out of love because that's what he gives us, not out of fear. And that's what the world teaches. And yet I find, I'm an old guy now, 63, right? <laughs> 60 plus years of habit of living a life of nervousness and fear. And there's a particular challenge. And I found myself at home alone. Rhonda was at work and I was, and it's kind of, I won't get into the particulars, but I was so struggling with that fear and, and the, that thing. And I felt Satan, you know, and that's mm -hmm. the power. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, I remembered one of my prayer partners when we used to live down in Loma Linda was saying, Jerry, take his, his wife, his name's Gary Carpenter, if anybody knows, Gary in Maryland. And he would stand at the front door and he says, you pray for that Shekinah glory to cover your home and your marriage and your relationships. Mm. It certainly works. And on that day, I actually did something. I, f I was in the middle of my kitchen. And yeah. unfortunately, the dog and the cat, they weren't right there. So <laughs> <laughs> no, but I did. I was so struggling, like more like I haven't in recent weeks and months. And I just cried out to God on my knees because I was so full of fear. And I said, just take this fear away because I was facing another obstacle and it does these times there's a lot more fear out there than there was of course we can say about COVID but COVID wakes you up basically I cried out in that and this song does make a big significance because I felt the power of the Holy Spirit and he lifted that fear Amen. I gave the fear Amen. up for love Amen. and remember that 
our scripture says, love casts out all fear. And fear is the devil's motion. So we all, at one time or another, will struggle with fear. Yep. But we today can sing that mighty power of God because I experienced it just the other day. Amen. And I love the last line of the last verse. There's not a place where we can flee, but God is present there. Let's Amen. sing. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command, and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed Where'er I turn my eye If I survey the ground I tread Or gaze upon the sky There's not a plant or flower below But makes thy glories known and clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. Creatures that borrow life from thee are subject to thy care. There's not a place where we can flee, but God is present there. Gazing upon the skies, have you ever seen what they're doing with the James Webb telescope? And they keep finding more and more and more. It's great because God's infinite, you know. You know, the next time they build a bigger one, it's just going to go farther. Victory in Jesus. It is amazing to know the power of God. And then, like you, you, you kneel in prayer and say, Jesus, take the fear and the victory is there because he wins every single time. This is such a John Rouse song. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. Yeah. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Amen. Oh, victory in Jesus, 
my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. And where does this victory come from? From Jesus, who lived, who died, who rose again. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. Now, do you guys on the trumpet have songs, the music with four flats or two? Four. The other hymnal has two. Four is fine. All right, go for it. Just not three flats. I just, I looked that up this morning and went, oh my... The trumpets like the two flats a little better, but... <laughs> On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and the best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above, to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true, its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. 
So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a Black or green? All right, children. Children's story. We're going to collect um, some offering for sidewalk kids. So you want to get one of those and go around and collect some? still have dollars, wave them high. <laughs> Oh, there's one more over here. Thank you, children. Good job. Good morning. Hello? Okay. <laughs> Have you ever been called mean or unkind names? Like weird or ugly or stupid? Has anybody ever called you that before? They have? Oh, it doesn't feel very good, does it? No. Well, when I was about six years old, my mom and my dad had jobs to go... Uh, to go to, so my sister and my brothers and I went to a daycare center every day after school. Now, I was teased every day by a lot of the kids there because I had long, thick, black, curly, frizzy hair. It was about this long. And guess what they called me? Witch. 
they used to chase me on the playground and just every day, witch, witch, witch. They used to do that a lot. No, that's not good. It really hurt my feelings really bad. And I felt like I was the ugliest person alive. But I lived, I survived, and I got older. And soon I didn't have to go to that daycare anymore. And when I went to grade school, like probably you guys, they called me by my real name, which is Kathy or Catherine. So at least they called me that instead of which. There were some of those, though, that still remembered what they used to call me in daycare. And every once in a while, they would call me that. But I just ignored them. And I tried to be a nice person. But I didn't feel very good about myself. I still thought I was the ugliest person in school. Then one day, when I was in fifth grade, are any of you in fifth grade? You're in fifth grade? Good. There was this really pretty girl, and her name was Sylvia. She, what, sweetheart? You're in, you're in second grade? No, two grade. Two grade? Oh. That's okay. Two and second are the same thing. Good for you. Sylvia was so pretty. Everyone thought so. She had this long, straight, shiny brown hair. She had pretty clothes and lots of friends. Everything I didn't have. And after school, Everyone wanted to walk home with Sylvia. They all ran over to her and started walking out of the playground. So I started walking home alone. But before I got to the end of the play yard, a boy by the name of Kenny came running up to me and said, I'll walk home with you. It's weird how I still remember their names. Those are the only two names I remember from elementary school. <laughs> I was so surprised. I said, OK. And as we started walking in silence, before we got 10 steps away, I stopped and I turned around and I asked him, why are you walking home with me instead of Sylvia like everybody else is? Kenny looked me in the eyes and said, because you're nice, and you're fun, and you have a good personality. I was so happy, and I was so grateful to Kenny for letting me know what is really important about myself and about other people. I never forgot what Kenny said to me that day. Ever since that day, I always try to see people in a different way, not just for how they look on the outside, but for how they are on the inside. Do you see people from the outside or the inside? Good for you. Good for you. I think Kenny's mom and dad taught him about Jesus. Did your mom and dad teach you about Jesus? Jesus says in the Bible, in John 15, 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So remember to show love to everybody like Jesus does, whether their name is Sylvia, or whether their name is Kenny, or whether their name is Grace, Grace, Guadalupe, Gideon, or Catherine. Okay, so thank you so much for hearing my story. You can go back to your seats now.
For since the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Of my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I walk no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We praise you this morning for your many blessings, your love and care, a safe place to worship. Thank you for the Sabbath day to come apart and meet with you, a time to fellowship and encourage each other. Thank you for the many blessings that you have provided us. And we think this, thank you this morning that we have a safe place to worship. It reminds us of those in Florida that many now do not have a place to worship. And I just pray that you'll be with them too. You know each person that is here today, whether young or not so young, and the blessings that you have for each one. There are those who aren't with us today. Some are ill, some are lonesome, and may be discouraged. You know the reason that each isn't here. And I ask that you'll be with Tim this morning, our speaker, and give us each the mind of Jesus. Help us to share with those about us. Amen. Bread of heaven, feed me till I Awesome, awesome. All right, now that you're all awake, we can get started. <laughs> it, is such a, it is such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for, for acting like you really enjoy being here yourself. <laughs> 
you enjoy the service and everything and what you do. Thanks for the music and everything. Uh, it's awesome. This must be a good place to come to church. So anyway, thank you for what you're doing and what you've been doing, keeping this place open through the pandemic and for years before that as well. It's a lot of work, uh, working for the Lord and keeping a church running. So God bless you, and may you continue and excel at whatever you're doing to keep this place going. Well, as was mentioned earlier, my name is uh, Tim Peterson, and I am the uh, director of the Plan Giving and Trust Services Department for the Oregon Conference. I've been here a time or two before, and uh, some of you have promised to call me, and I'm still waiting. <laughs> but I'm not upset. So it's all good, amen? amen? Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that, if that's all right with you. If we can do anything to help, please let us know. We're happy to do so. We have a great, great department down there, and looking forward to working with you in the future. For now, though, I want to get right to my message. It's called Foolishness. And before I get started, we better pray, right? Father in heaven, just thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day, this time to, to be together in fellowship and to worship you. I just pray that you'll be with us here and draw us to yourself. May our thoughts be heavenly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, have you ever done anything foolish? <laughs> you don't have to share what it is or what it was. <laughs> but I'm sure you have. Everyone's done something foolish at least once, except for one person that we all know, right? But the rest of us, we're in the foolishness camp, right? I mean, maybe it was at home or at work or at school. Or maybe it was when you were a child. That's when a lot of it happened, right? Maybe a teenager, a lot more happened then. Or maybe as an adult, maybe you did something foolish. Maybe for you, like me, it was a lifestyle choice. I mean... Maybe, maybe for you it was you took a spoonful of sugar and put it right in there. I mean, you heard Mary Poppins say a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, and you tried it with or without medicine, and uh, I did that, and I didn't like it without medicine even. I mean, I didn't like it. Sugar was kind of nasty just taking a spoonful like that. Maybe for you it wasn't sugar, but maybe it was a spoonful of dirt. I mean, little. Well, I tried that too. I didn't like it either. But shortly thereafter, I saw a 60 Minutes program. I mean, this was decades ago, just so you know. Decades ago, 60 Minutes program where this university professor, every night with his dinner salad, sprinkled a spoonful of dirt on it, and he said how healthy and wonderful it is for us. But he did, he did uh, offer one word of caution. He did say, make sure that it was clean dirt. <laughs> In other words, he said, make sure there were no animals around. Make sure you know where the dirt is coming from. Well, maybe dirt wasn't your thing either. Maybe for you, it was a spoonful of super-duper hot sauce. Hmm. Or perhaps you took a bite of one of those special chocolate bars. You know, the ones that x Lax makes. <laughs> Not knowing the consequences of that, you know. I did all of those foolish things. All of us have done something foolish at one time or another. And now it's true that the word foolish can actually mean different things. For example, it could mean dangerous or dumb or disobedient or even something different besides all of those things. Like the word fool can mean that you really like something, right? Like if you're a fool for chocolate, that means you really like chocolate, right? 
Yeah, so we have to be careful how we use words. Words like fool and foolish and, and foolishness. I mean, for example, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, it's not good to call someone a fool, he said. He said, if you do that, you're in danger of hellfire. So we're certainly not going to do that today, call someone a fool, okay? But then on the other hand, in another place, God did call someone a fool. Luke chapter 12, verses 26 to, or excuse me, verses 16 to 20. You may remember the story about the man who had a, a great harvest, right? And he decided that he needed to build bigger barns in order to store everything. And then he was going to kick back and take it easy. I don't know about you, but that sounds an awful lot like retirement. Storing up lots of resources, taking it easy for a long time. But I think there's something more to the story there that, that Jesus was talking about. It's not talking against, you know, careful planning and prudence and, and depending upon the, the blessing of God in order to be able to retire. It's not talking against that. But instead, it's talking about selfish, selfishness and, and greed and reckless living without any consideration of God at all. You notice the guy didn't say anything about God at all in the blessing of God there. So you can see it's important to carefully consider what you mean by the word fool, for example, or foolish or foolishness. In the Bible, there's lots of foolish things. I mean, like when you read in the Old Testament, for example, this line, this king did that which is evil in the sight of the Lord. Foolishness, right? Foolishness. There was some kind of foolishness connected with that all the time. I mean, especially when you think about the miraculous things that God did. I mean, it seemed that God was there. He was there at those times, blessing his people, and yet they defied God, and they followed these so-called false gods, which weren't really gods at all, just stuff they made up from wood or stone or whatever. That was foolish of them. Wasn't it? I mean, think back to the time when God led the, the children of Israel out of Egypt. You know, pillar of fire by night, pillar of cloud by day. He was right there all the time. And yet, what did they do? They built a golden calf and worshipped it as if that was God. Foolishness. Foolishness. And then there were times when the opposite of that type of thing happened. In other words, they were foolish in a different way. You might even say a good way. Remember the day when, when the Philistines sent Goliath out to challenge them? I mean, Goliath was literally nine feet tall. He was this huge, mighty warrior. Goliath. Nine feet tall. Have you ever done a, a search online of, of human giants? I mean, it's amazing the kind of stuff that, that comes up there. One of them, one example is Robert Wadlow of Alton, Illinois. He was born about 100 years ago, and he grew to be almost nine feet tall. Nine feet tall. But he died at the age of 22 back in 1940 from the disease that made him so tall, right? Lots of giants throughout history. And so here's this, this massive warrior, Goliath, standing out there in front of the people of Israel, nine feet tall, cursing God and challenging Israel. And so what does Israel do? They send out a little boy to challenge Goliath. Now, if you didn't know the story, that would be foolish, wouldn't it? That would be foolish. But it wasn't. Why not? Because 
David won. Right? David won. Yeah, God, through David, won. That's the difference, right? That's the difference in the story. So when it's obvious that you're going to lose, it seems foolish to enter the contest, right? But when you win, it seems like it was the right thing to do. There was a man who ran for political office many times, and most of those times, he lost. So you'd think it was foolish for him to keep trying. I mean, listen to his track record. 1832, he lost his job and he was defeated for the state legislature. 1833, he failed in business. Sadly, in 1835, his sweetheart died. 1836, no surprise, he had a nervous breakdown. 1838, defeated as Speaker of the State House. 1843, defeated for nomination to U.S. Congress. 1854, defeated for U.S. Senate. 1856, defeated for nomination as Vice President. 1858, defeated for U.S. Senate again. Then in 1860, elected President of the United States. Who is he? Of course, you know, Abraham Lincoln, right? Abraham Lincoln thought by many to be one of our best presidents, yet some thought it was foolish for him to run for office. But it wasn't foolish, why? Because he won, right? Because he won, and he did a lot of good. Winning makes a lot of things seem right. So you see, there are times we need to be careful what we consider to be foolish. I mean, how much weight do you put into what other people think? How much weight do you put into what you think? And think maybe it would be better for us to put more weight into what God thinks. Amen? Today, we often celebrate Christ's death and resurrection. Two things that are so crucial to our salvation and central to the message of the Bible. And we, we celebrate it, you know, at least once a year, like at what we call Easter time, or maybe uh, four times a year at communion. Did you have communion last Sabbath, or is it going to be next Sabbath, last Sabbath? Yeah. I mean, some people celebrate it every week, and some even celebrate it Every day, every day, the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's so important. However, to an unbeliever, those things seem foolish, foolish. To say a person lived 2,000 years ago on the other side of the earth and they died for you seems foolish to a lot of people, doesn't it? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, and a lot of my verses are going to be from the New English translation today, it says there, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. To them, it is foolishness. To us, it is the power of God. In another verse, it explains why that is. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, this time, verse 14. It says, The unbeliever does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So you see, the importance of Jesus can, can never be overstated. Jesus is so enormous to our faith and to our lives, but in order to really appreciate that, we need the Spirit of God working in us in order to do so. We can't just come up with that on our own. 
Only the Spirit can help us to understand Jesus and accept him and appreciate him. It's something very personal between us and God. And it can happen anywhere, at any time, and especially wherever and whenever you did something foolish. And that's good news. That is really good news. You see, you can't experience forgiveness on your own. You need God. You need God. People often find God at a place like this. Experiencing what we're experiencing right now. What we're experiencing right now, some consider foolishness. Nevertheless, it's ordained by God. And that is preaching. It was in our scripture for today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world by its wisdom did not know God, God was pleased to save those who believe by the foolishness of preaching. So you see, there is some foolishness going on here today. <laughs> Yet there's something about this entire process that is blessed of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25 says, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than any human strength. In other words, God knows what he's doing. God knew what he was doing. And yet maybe... Maybe there are times when it doesn't seem like it's working. Maybe there are times when it doesn't seem like the preaching is, is getting through. Nevertheless, God calls us to keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep it up. You never know who's going to come through the doors of the church. Well, you came through. And that's good enough, right? But there could be more. There could be more. While there's still time, there could be more. As 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23 says, But we preach about Christ crucified, even though it's a stumbling block for the Jews and foolishness for the Gentiles. Yet for thousands of years, it has worked. It has worked. And I'll have to admit that, that I never thought much about the cross of Jesus or the meaning of it until after I became a believer. It wasn't the cross that convinced me to be a believer. It was only after that that the cross began to mean anything at all to me. But now it means everything. Everything. To me. It was really my, my sense of the need of mercy. That's what drew me to God. Then it was the cross that gave me the understanding of the cost of the mercy that I so desperately wanted and needed. You see, without the cross, there can be no true mercy. It really wasn't the cross itself, however. It was really the one who died on the cross. It was what he accomplished on the cross that makes mercy and salvation possible. And really, the key question for today is really, who was it that died on the cross? Who was it? 
That question takes me back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created. You see, without the existence of the creator God mentioned there, the cross makes absolutely no sense at all. Because just anybody can't die for you. God had to. God had to. And it's a challenge for some people to believe in a creator today. Let's face it, right? I mean, we are constantly being bombarded from every side about evolution. So it's a challenge for people to believe in God today. Which one is foolish, to believe or not to believe? Well, the Bible answers this question in Psalm 14. Psalm 14, verse 1, where it says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So according to the Bible, it is foolish not to believe, right? I mean, think about it. You can do a lot of foolish things and still make it to heaven, amen? But you cannot make it to heaven if you don't believe in God. So which is foolisher? (laughs) Is that a word? (laughs) You won't make it to heaven without believing in God. Therefore, it makes so much sense to believe in God. And it's that foolishness of not believing that I want to help you avoid with the rest of our time together. That's all right with you. Because the more I think about the origin of life, the more that creation makes sense to me. I mean, when you look deeply at a cell, a so-called simple cell, you see see it in all its components, you realize it is very, very complex. Darwin didn't know that in 1844, but we do now. It is extremely complex, and to me, it didn't just come about by accident. I mean, think about this. Uh, think Think about your eye, for example, or you could pick your nose or your ears or your sense of touch or your feelings in general, any of those things. But think about the eye. How would an eye randomly develop by accident? I mean, it makes no sense to me. Think about this. Let's say there was an eyeless cell millions or billions of years ago. And somehow this this eyeless cell got the sense that it wanted to see how it knew what sight was or how it knew what anything was is a mystery. But then millions of years later, all of a sudden, a perfectly working eye appeared on that eyeless cell just because one of its you know, ancestors way back there had the thought that it needed to see. Who makes, or I mean, anyway. To me, it makes no sense at all. No sense at all. Instead, the endless variety and beauty of perfectly formed plants and animals and people that we see all around us, perfectly formed, with no missing links anywhere. I mean, to me, that speaks of a loving creator God. Sorry for my heavy breathing here, but... I like God. Does that help? Can you still hear? Okay. I mean, think about this. All the Bible writers, Old Testament and New Testament, believed in creation. Jesus believed in creation. So either Jesus, the Bible, creation, and salvation are all true, or none of it is. 
as I look around me, as I look at the world around me, it just, it seems logical to me that creation is just as the Bible describes it. When I look at the physical condition of the earth today, I see evidence for a global flood all around. I mean, there's fossil marine life everywhere. On all the mountaintops, even Everest, it's there. When Mount St. Helens erupted not too far from here, back in 1980, I mean, it helped people to see how rapidly catastrophic change can happen and how it shaped the surface of our earth. How quickly layers can be deposited and how quickly erosion can take place. I mean, to me, the flood account from the Bible helps me make sense of the world that I see around me today. The flood is also true, not foolishness. There are many other examples of things that help me to believe that, that God is true and the Bible is true and not foolishness. And just a couple of examples of that, of things that have helped me. You know, back 150 years ago or 200 years ago, whatever it was, when evolution was becoming more and more popular, they began to look at the Bible with a critical eye. And they tried to discredit the Bible from the things that they saw or didn't see there. And one of the things they they brought out was... You know, all these things associated with Jesus and the cross and all of that kind of revolve around this character by the name of Pontius Pilate. The Bible talks a lot about him, but we don't find anything anywhere outside of the Bible about him. So, hmm, the Bible can't be true, right, you guys? Then... <laughs> Then, about 60 years ago, in 1961, they were doing some work in a stadium there in Caesarea, you know, the amphitheater there, and somebody just happened to flip over one of the bench seats there. And that had been a plaque from 2,000 years ago. And on the other side of the plaque, where you didn't sit, was the name Pontius Pilate. He had dedicated that stadium, or it was dedicated to him. Yeah. To me, again, confirming that Pontius Pilate was a real guy, and the Bible is really true. Well, that didn't work, so they tried another one. David. David, yeah, I mean, the Old Testament is full of David. See him all over there, but we don't see him anywhere outside of the Bible. Same kind of provocation. Must not be true. Oh, well, then again, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, they found a stone. (laughs) And on the stone mentions the house of David from roughly 3,000 years ago. Same kind of thing, right? confirming that that David was real. And there are several things like that, and they come up from time to time. They come up from time to time. And it helps me to believe that God and Jesus and creation and the flood and the Bible are true, and they are not foolishness. And all of this is extremely significant to me, and it's so important because it all ties into why Jesus is so significant. And I want to share with you a passage today, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, which helps bring all these things together in one Bible passage. So let's take a careful look at it here real quick. 
Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. It says there, he, I'm reading the New King James this time, he. Who is the he there? That is Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Verse 16, for by him, for by Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Jesus is our creator. Verse 17, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He made it, and he's keeping it made. He's keeping it going. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he, and here it is, in all things he may have the preeminence. Preeminence. He's it. If there ever was an it, he's it, right? He is it. Verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus, all the fullness should dwell. Verse 20 now. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him. Again there. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, here it is now, the conclusion. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. In other words, the Christ who died on the cross is God. He is our creator. Only the creator of life could pay the price sin cost in taking the life of everyone in order to restore eternal life to those who believe. Only the price he paid could do that. For us. Wow. Well, there's more I need to share today about Jesus being true and not foolishness. Because, I mean, it doesn't take much to believe that, that somebody died. It doesn't take much to believe that, but it does take something to believe that that person that died rose again and is alive forevermore. That's something else, right? That's something else. J. Warner Wallace. J. Warner Wallace. He was a cold case homicide detective. And he took a look at the resurrection of Jesus from his angle, from his perspective. And he said, in a cold case, there are four things used to examine the evidence. And here they are. One, witnesses present. Witnesses present. Were they actually there? Were they actually witnesses? So you verify that. Number two, corroboration. In other words, is there any other evidence or are there any other witnesses and does that other evidence or witnesses and or witnesses agree with these other original witnesses? Number three, consistency and accuracy. In other words, does the story change over time? People changing their stories over time. And finally, number four, is there presence of bias? Is there presence of bias? In other words, is there any motive that anybody should be lying here? Any motive for lying? 
And uh, as J. Warner Wallace was doing his investigation, he, he came to realize that, that Jesus believed in the evidential approach. He believed in believing based on evidence. In other words, Jesus didn't want people believing him based on blind faith. So he could, he could see that. And something else that he could see, a very key background point that uh, Warren presented was this. He came to realize that the Old Testament prophesied things about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus and that the disciples, the apostles, were witnesses of the fulfillment of those prophecies. So this was not just some random story anywhere. There was a lot of significant things related to this. And after examining all the evidence, he made these four points, these four conclusions. Number one, Jesus died on the cross and was buried. Number two, Jesus' tomb was empty, and no one ever produced his dead body. Number three, Jesus' disciples believed they saw Jesus alive after he was resurrected from the dead and never recanted their testimony. And finally, number four, Jesus' disciples were transformed following their alleged resurrection observations. That's what he concluded. And that was about 17 years ago when J. Warner Wallace was an atheist. But as he looked at all of the evidence, he, he was convinced himself that it was true. And not foolishness, so he became a believer himself. Millions of people over the past 2,000 years have been convinced of the same thing. I am one of them. How about you? Yes. Amen. I like the waiter Peter. The Apostle Peter described his experience about all this. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 19, he said, We did not follow cleverly concocted fables. In other words, we did not follow a bunch of foolishness. When we made known to you the power and return of our Lord Jesus Christ. No, we were eyewitnesses of his grandeur. For he received honor and glory from God the Father. When that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, this is my dear son in whom I am delighted. When this voice was conveyed from heaven, we heard it. For we were with him on the holy mount. Moreover, in other words, even better than that, we possess the prophetic word as an altogether reliable thing. I like the King James says here, we have a more sure word of prophecy. And he says, you would do well to pay attention to this as you would to a light shining in a murky place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Wow. That is such a good passage. So powerful. In other words, Peter is saying, we saw him with our own eyes. We heard the voice of God from heaven with our own ears. But more than that, we have the words of prophecy that he fulfilled. We saw him fulfilling those 
things. It's the same words that we have today in our Bibles, right? Better than seeing with your own eyes, better than being there and hearing with your own ears. We have it today in our hands, in our hands. So look at the evidence. Look at all the evidence. Look at all of it you can until you too are convinced that Jesus is who he said he is and that he is your personal Savior and Lord too. I mean, to me, to me, that's the wisest thing you can ever do. And it will help you avoid a lot of foolishness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you again so much for who you are and all these things that you've given to us to help us to believe and to avoid a lot of foolishness. Help us to believe today with all of our heart and stronger and stronger as each day passes and as that great day nears when we will see you face to face for the first time. In Jesus' name, amen. So how can we do anything but exclaim about God, how great thou art. Let's all stand and sing this together. O Lord, Lord my God, God when, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great. God, his, his son, son not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, 
my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration, and there proclaim, My God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. How great thou art. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, how great you are. Lord Jesus, you're the same. Thank you for allowing us and drawing us here to worship you today. And now as we leave this place with you in our hearts and in our thoughts, we ask you to continue to guide and direct us and protect us. Be with the Orchard Church. Continue uh, to bless them as they represent you in these neighborhoods and in this community. Be with each person, each family represented here, those that are watching on the YouTube channel. Lord, continue to guide us, draw us to you, Protect us and direct us as we seek to serve you the best way we can while there's still time. And then at last, when you do come again, may we all be together rejoicing without anyone missing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.